<laughs> Welcome back to the program. Our first uh, conversation has to do with what's really the essence of this season called the Easter. Today is called the Good Friday, the belief by a Christian faithful that Jesus died today and resurrected the third day for the salvation of mankind. And we've been joined, we've been joining the program by what we will call a young shining light. I'm sure you've seen some of his videos on Instagram and some of those strong messages uh, that has attracted a lot of followership. Pastor Femi Lazarus of the Felid Pastor Sphere of Light Church. He joins us via Zoom. Pastor Lazarus, thank you so much for coming on the morning brief. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you beyond Instagram this time. That's the closest. <laughs> That's Thank the you clo so much. Thank That's you. the closest. Isn't it? All right, let, let, let's get straight to it, uh, Pastor Lazarus, at this particular one. Uh, there are so many narratives sometimes, but uh, the consistency is the fact that there was a sacrifice made for the season. But walk us through what the essence of this season really is. I mean, um, while um, there might be um, lots of um, narratives are touching um, if really historically um, this is around the same time that Christ died um, one thing we cannot deny is the fact that um, it has been historically proven that Christ came um, lived and then died um, Easter really um, is a season to um, celebrate or to mark the essence of that sacrifice, um, a season set apart to recognize, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the essence. So uh, for everyone who is um, curious about how they can adapt this uh, to their personal life, because uh, if the Christ died and resurrected is for a reason, uh, not just for fun fair. For the persons who are saying, how do I adapt this into my life to resonate to my fellow man and woman, if you may, um, walk us through that process where you can actually be a shining light yourself uh, to, to, your, to your fellow human being. I mean, um, I, 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 there's no better example I could have given like um, the personal testimony of Paul. And a very interesting one, really. Paul, speaking in 1 Timothy 1, from 11, described himself as one that was before um, a blasphemer, one who was injurious. He used the word one who was given to persecuting people and then encountered um, that life of Christ. You see, in essence, it's, it's, it's beyond just a religious celebration. Um, um, the fact speaks for itself that when people really encounter this life, that the transformation that occurs, you know, um, in their lives that that ends up affecting even the society at large. Um, the Bible says that um, righteousness of folks and nation and sin is a reproach to any people, and exactly that gift of righteousness is what Christ has come to give us. You see, so what I'm trying to say in essence is the essence of the sacrifice of Christ is not limited to church activities alone. Um, it is such that if well understood and um, demonstrated, it affects the entire human day-to-day -day living in the sense that when we have people who understand the sacrifice of Christ and are living the life he has come to give, all right, there will be change in the society. The world becomes a better place. So what I'm saying is beyond church, beyond carrying Bible, beyond all those things that we are branded as organized religion is the definite change that accepting this life brings to everyone. Uh, and that's the essence of it, really, if you consider um, the, the message and the value of the season. But, you know, we're not... Um, in deficit of it we're actually in a surfeit of it if you consider that nigeria is a praying nation and uh, we're in fact <laughs> uh, a nation that exports it to the world when you consider the number of nigerians who minister you know across the world but the paradox of of it is you know that the results are not as evident even in other nations that are not a, a praying nation as nigeria is 
when you reflect on this paradox, I'm sure you've had the opportunity, you've been asked this question over again as a cleric. When you reflect on this paradox, what really is the challenge? Why don't we have the results that a praying nation should have? I mean, it, it's quite concerning. Um, and I, I, I will say this. Um, I, I think the issue is that we, we have not come to understand um, what key opens what door. You see, as powerful as prayer is, um, it's fantastic, really. But we, I, we need to go beyond just praying and um, filling our churches to shining the light where it really matters. Um, Joseph did not just pray in Egypt. He was able to give meaningful solution that was relevant, relevant to the problem of his days. Daniel did not just pray in Babylon. They were able to prescribe relevant solutions that was relevant in their days. So I, I think that um, we, we need to go beyond just being known for prayer um, to really raising transformational leaders. You see, that will carry the import of those spiritual energies and then develop and change things practically, you see, where it is really needed, um, beyond just um, us praying in church. Uh, prayer is powerful, but, but prayer um, will not um, um, really in itself change the economy. We need to have people who have the wisdom, who studied for it, all right? What we come in as people of faith does is that now we bring something to the table which is a character that is consistent with what we have received. But also we bring a measure of light that is beyond just our church walls. If a person lights candle when it is or during, when it is sunny, you may want to refer to the person as a madman. We need to shine the lights where it is really dark, and that's out there. You know, there are a lot of people who have or seem to have lost faith in government or the governance structure of nations, particularly this nation, young and old. I mean, it traverses all age categories, ethnicity, walks of life. And they always come to religion, in this case, uh, Christianity, for some soccer. And some, some people have said religion is the opium of the masses. Some other people disagree. It's more than just opium. It doesn't just get you high. It does way more than that. So yet again, we have turned our attention to religion because that is where we find hope most times to then translate it into other parts of our lives. In this case, governance. You said earlier on that righteousness exalts a nation. Nigeria needs a lot of exalting. So uh, are we missing the righteousness part on the governance uh, sector and for the followership? Uh, is it that there's some righteousness, but it is not enough? The measure of the righteousness is not enough. Or there is just a lot of sin, because the scripture also says sin is a reproach thereof. So speak to us. I want us to speak to the heart uh, of the issue as it relates to the power which is in that, you know, resurrection. I mean, if, if you ask me, Nigeria is a highly religious nation. And um, somehow, people have not just lost faith in the government. They, some, many also seem to have lost faith um, in the church. Um, or let me, let me um, narrow my conversation to the church. And in essence, the reason is because people, um, they are not finding much difference. Um, they feel if, if the government is oppressive and subjugating, um, the church should do better in terms of um, practices, in terms of doctrines, um, in terms of um, not exploiting the people and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think what the church needs at this time is to understand the balance of exporting the essence of what our faith holds. What builds a nation goes beyond religion, you see. Um, Dubai is a Muslim nation, um, um, Saudi Arabia and all that, you see. So it's not just about, I mean, if it's about religion, does that mean that we carry people and fix them in positions whether they are qualified or not qualified simply because they are religious folks? No. We are, we, we are talking about the fact that we need to raise transformational leaders. Um, what the faith does now is to bring um, perspective to that in the sense that we do not just have people 
who are leaders, but people who, you see, there is something having the consciousness of eternity in view does. It guides character. You see that now. And, um, and in essence, if we look at the person that this season is about, <laughs> is one man who changed the course of history through his sacrifice. If we all follow that example, then we understand that that calls us to live a sacrificial life. That if I have the opportunity to lead an aspect of the government, it is not an opportunity to embezzle or an opportunity to, 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 to make the lives of the people miserable. That same compassion of Christ is demonstrated to our life. I, I believe if we understand this balance, um, there will be um, a, a bit of, people will cut the church some slack. I, I tell you in essence, people are angry because they have not found much difference. And that puts lots of responsibility on the church to do beyond praying, but to raise people who represent the difference that we need in our world today. Let's dig further into the things that Coyote asks and you are responding to, which has to do with the strength of character. Um, how can people of faith build better strength of character, resilient enough to be able to withstand already hot spaces where they're getting into, especially public offices, where there are opportunities to misbehave, but for some reason, you choose to stand as a man or woman of integrity. So when you walk us through with, maybe help us walk through the fact that this is how Jesus did it, and this is how it should be done beyond semantics. Uh, thank you so much for, for that important question. Um, Jesus did not get involved in the politics of his days. He, he stayed away from it. But he raised people and he gave the instruction to occupy. You see that? I mean, Jesus did his every ministry for three and a half years. So um, the, uh, uh, the core of our Christian faith, really, um, as re re relating to these times, it's a call to occupy sectors, all right, with the light that we have received. But it is not just about occupying those sectors. It is about the people, you see, many people misrepresent the faith. I mean, quote, this person is a Christian, so it deserves to be here. Oh, that person is a Christian, so it deserves to be there. And, and you find out that they, sometimes they are even doing worse than those who are not Christians. And sometimes they, they, there seems to be no much difference. Maybe for lack of adequate training, and maybe for um, lack of personal preparation to understand that the core of Christian faith is that the life we now live is not our own life, but we live all right, for the one who died for us, which in essence demands a measure of sacrifice and proper um, representation where we have been planted. I, and you know, that, that, that question is quite instructive for everyone really, for the followership and for the leadership, you know, because this season and even during the season of the other religion, so many messages uh, are put out from those in elected offices encouraging that those values be embraced. Uh, but we also often wonder why the results trickling down from those offices uh, are in contradiction of the expectations of the followership. But let's talk about the role of the men in Kasok also themselves, uh, either adorned physically or by conviction. Uh, and I'm asking this because, you know, you have even had cause uh, to uh, take a swipe at uh, clerics who support uh, elected officials who rig themselves in, in office. And also in recent times, uh, the minister of the FCT has had cause to also be critical of churches who neglect uh, public office holders after they leave office. Uh, that statement, you know, cannot be ignored without cause for reflection about what exactly is going on, you know, behind the scenes uh, that would have uh, necessitated that kind of comment. So my question is, what, 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 what comes to your mind when you reflect on this? And are there opportunities, you know, for truth telling uh, among members of the CASOC, uh, you know, beyond the microphones, beyond the pulpit, about what really their conduct should be in reflecting 
the values yet again of the season that we're talking about? Now, I mean, thank you so much for that very important question. Um, th let me start from here. Th there's an old saying um, that you cannot be more Catholic than a Pope. Um, Jesus himself had 12. And among the 12, there was one who was a thief. Um, so I, I want us to understand that while religious leaders have roles to play um, in demonstrating the life of integrity as the Bible at John Soss, I mean, First Timothy chapter number three, that the one who desires the office of a bishop must be blameless and least at other qualities. We must also understand that people choose to become what they want to become. However, the one who stands to represent God must do so in integrity of heart in order to have a life that convicts people, you see. Um, and that, in essence, tells um, demands from us, put a demand from us, including myself as church leaders, to um, represent and live the kind of life that is worthy of commanding the needed integrity that we want to see in the society by first demonstrating what we want to see in our lifestyle or through our lifestyle all right that i mean the bible says if we suffer we should not suffer as thieves and all that so that the cleric now knows that a responsibility is on me as a pastor not just to be loud when i hold the mic but to be loud with a lifestyle that commands integrity um such that we will be able to call to order where we should call to order now either pays the piper dictates the tune and that tells us that the relationship between the cleric and um, political office orders in terms of money must be one that should be caught. Uh, you referenced earlier on that Jesus had just three plus years for his ministry, died uh, 33 thereabouts uh, by the records. And I think that just places a huge burden on young people, particularly young Nigerians. And I just wanna ask you, does that imply that the salvation of our nation may just be on the shoulders of young people? I mean, in, in all honesty, I, I think we need to first and foremost understand that Nigeria is still young as a nation, historically now. I'm currently in London. Um, I mean, and I, I'm looking at things here and I'm saying, in all honesty, while these nations have um, the hype, uh, we, we should thank God for Nigeria. Let's start from there. Okay, sometimes people who maybe have not stepped outside the shores just believe that um, maybe there are some gold somewhere on the trees and everywhere here. All right, but we, we must also understand it is not about being young. Some young people are more crooks than those who they call crooks. It is about carrying the lifestyle and the needed knowledge, the balance. All right, to lead the nation to where it should go. So age does not directly impact that. Uh, it, 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 anyone who has what it takes should get there. And I, I think because of the complexity of Nigeria, experience should also not be um, underrated. All right, so we need young people, yes. But we need young people who are not crude, yes. We need young people who have the needed knowledge, yes. We need young people who have the needed experience, yes. So not just about being young. But so last was there's another question that uh, maybe let's get back into the church hall this time uh, because that whatever happens in the church hall or within the space of the church affects the society in general. So since we're talking about young people, maybe you help young people identify fake pastors, help them decipher and discern fake pastors who are gaming the faith. How can they do that? Because some are gullible. I mean, the Bible is very clear on that. So um, since the Bible is very clear, um, what, what I'm just going to say about that is that um, the emergence of fake pastors or whatever is powered by the presence of fake Christians who have failed to know the truth for themselves. All right, since the Bible is clear as touching the distinct character of the wolf apart from the shepherd, um, it is important that we study for ourselves and find out what the Bible says. And when you understand what the Bible says, then you will not be a victim of fake and false pastors, um, as it implies. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> fake, fake pastors. <laughs> I, I'm doing a double take on your submission. Uh, fake pastors 
okay. thrive as a result of fake Christians. So Christians must reflect on their originality status, especially at this time. Um, let's go to the followership now. Uh, as we reflect again on the values of the season, what options are open to them uh, to put the leadership to account as they continue to, um, you know, advocate really and uh, pray for the, the yearnings that they desire, you know, at this point in time and even beyond the season? I mean, um, bread is not so different for Christians as, as it is sold to Muslims. Um, the price of petrol is not different um, based on religion. So I, I, I'd rather speak as a citizen that we, we have the responsibility, really, as citizens of Nigeria um, to hold our public officers to account. All right? We have the responsibility. Uh, so it goes beyond church. And, um, but, you know, it is difficult when Ketul is calling Port Black. Um, Nigeria is not where it is just for public officers. Nigeria is where it is also for the crowd that want small things. Uh, when people begin to demand for more, um, and when you demand for bigger things, you reject small things. You will understand that um, bread, rice, and t-shirt and cap is nothing compared to four years of um, the leadership of someone who knows what it is to lead the nation in the right direction. So when the people understand that this is where we want to go and um, they hold to account and insist on that, then public officers will adjust and that's, what, that's my take on that. You know, you can, you resonate with uh, this season, not just by conviction, not just by faith, but also by name. I mean, you have come forth on the one hand, and you know, Lazarus yeah. in the Bible experienced uh, resurrection as well. So first, let me just say thank you for coming forth on the morning brief. Thank you so a, much. A lot of people see you uh, online. They love what you do. You have sort of found a way uh, to get a lot of young people interested in you know Christianity. So through those videos, they are very short, but they're incisive, passes the message across and people, you know, it leaves them yearning for more and also exploring uh, to find their own conviction. But uh, not a lot of people know about your personal story. You've talked about the personal story of Paul, but Give us an insight. It's very rare for pastors uh, to share personal stories for obvious reasons because they're all about Christ uh, and, and the faith. But we, we also need to hear some part of your story. So for a lot of people who are thinking, nah, you probably just dropped from heaven. The angels literally dropped you in an Uber. You also had your own experience before you, you've become who you are today. So what, of, what, what is that high point of your story you, you might want to share with us today? I mean, th thank you so much um, for that question. Uh, I'd refer to myself as one um, whose life started from the lowest point. So I, I can relate. I understand what it means to go through life and not have an assurance if the future is really certain. Uh, and, and, and I think probably that's where um, the message kind of connects with people. As one who had been at the point of committing suicide or several attempts and then rescued by grace and then saved by the grace of God as one who had no um, expectation really of a future because I thought I would have killed myself before getting there. So I, I know what the low, what it means to be at the lowest point. And um, I also know what it means for the grace of God to save one and bring one into the fold. And I, I think maybe what we are doing differently is to um, bring the gospel in a way that connects with day-to-day -day living and the experience of the people and um, the practical application of the message so that we are not abstract. And I, I think that's where my life is coming from. And um, like Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And we are still on the journey, all right, to where God is taking us to. Okay, uh, as we begin to wind down, there's a question for you. Uh, but before I ask the question, as you're answering the question, maybe also speak to what is considered personality cultism in the Christian faith, which is basically about um, uh, people literally uh, maybe going beyond borders to literally 
close to idol worship their quote-unquote men of God. Uh, maybe you have to speak to that as well. But this person says, Good Friday morning, Good Friday morning bridge show. <laughs> okay. I My question is, even as we celebrate this Easter period, that what should be our attitude towards the Easter season? Because some of the, some are of the opinion that since it is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are celebrating, it should be a period of mourning. Should that really be it, sir? So he wants to be sure if somebody is dying, why are we celebrating? Perhaps. I mean, there's a lot to celebrate because he, he died, yes, but he didn't stay dead. He rose. He rose never to die again. And the Bible said when he rose, we also rose with him, in essence, from the grave. So um, that's what we are celebrating. We are celebrating life, not death. Okay? Um, that's the essence, really. Um, do I answer to the issue of personality cultism? Yes, now? please. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, I, I, it, it's in two ways, really. First is in the part of the clergy. I, I think the um, form of leadership or demonstrated really to an average African is the monarchical system um, where there's a king and then there are people following. But that is not what the Bible demonstrates. We have Jesus that lived as a man and then ate with people, had day-to-day -day conversation, interacted with people. Um, so, in essence, that is the call on us. We have not been called as celebrities. Rather, we have been called as leaders. I mean, I, I remember recently, um, one of my videos was misunderstood and misconstrued by the general public where I spoke about the, the need all right, for certain structures in church, and, and then why not? Why can't there be protocols? Not bodyguards, you see. Um, but I, I don't want to go there into that. Um, people sometimes, um, because of gratitude, tend to overstep the boundary of communicating gratitude. And sometimes there are some um, who create the structure for their own agenda. All right, but what I say now is that we must understand that times are changing and we are facing a generation with a very unique challenge that our operations and our style must change to meet with the unique demands of that generation. It is time for the shepherd to smell as the sheep. All right, and then um, that's, that's, that's the balance I'm going to bring to that. Quite insightful, Pastor Femi Lazarus, lead pastor of Self Light Church. Thank you so much uh, for your insight. And we'll continue to watch those videos and get more insight. Lots of young people like you. Uh, we must say that. And I'm sure they are rooting for you. But most thank you for taking our time to bring uh, to us the importance and the essence of this particular season. And wish you the very, very best as you progress in your journey of ministry. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's it on that particular conversation. Of course, we'll switch gears now after this break. He's already here with us. He's really eccentric in everything you can talk about as far as his style is concerned and his music. His name, Testimony Jagger, joins us after this break. Join us again.